I'm glad the, these papers are coming in. Yes, yours is there. Um, keep them coming. They're all very good. They show that you're all I'm not in despair. I find that you're really getting something out of the course once in a while and in the long run. Uh, I don't know if the brothers have been hearing Father Pryor's talks in chapter, but they're pretty good. I hope they're... Are they on tape? They ought to be on tape. They ought to be on tape. That's the, yeah? Well, he's a smart man. <laughs> he's thinking about his future, his canonization, and things like that. <laughs> well, <clears throat> it's very good anyway. It's, uh, he's talking about real fundamental issues that we... Because the order is going through a time of adjustment and change, and these things are very fundamental. That's good stuff. Uh, and of course, obviously, pray like mad over this election, because this big election, they see, as I was saying, you've got these different groups in the order. And because uh, I, I don't know, what, it's not for me to be prophesying. But one, of the, one of the best candidates is Don Willebrord of Tilburg. But the thing about Don Willebrord of Tilburg is these Dutch monks are... Are on this. Uh, are on the. I mean, he's very good. He's got a good monastic formation course. He's the first one that started monastic formation. But the Dutch monks are are the ones who are more for this uh, this activity stuff too. I don't know, getting out of the monastery and that sort of stuff. So of course, the cigars. So just because Don Willy, if Don Willieboard gets in, don't automatically think we're all going to get cigars at Christmas. But uh, <coughs> there's. Anyway, and then the, several of us told Dom James that he might get it, and now he's worried. Because <laughs> he might. I mean, he might. He might be a compromised candidate. See, the French and the Dutch and the Belgians might get themselves in a deadlock, and they might end up electing an American just to break the deadlock. So, in other words, it's, a, it's quite a thing. <laughs> Never know what's going to come up. Well, now, of course, this all ties in with St. Bernard, uh, see, we want to talk about this uh, tract on conversion. And now, remember, who was this thing on conversion preached to? It's a, it's real. It's a real rip roaring sermon. And then it was preached to a certain class of people. You would call them today by one word. What would be the word you'd call them today as a general class? Paris University students. Paris University students. Well, now, what does that correspond? Does that correspond to Paris University students today? Exactly. Well, not quite. They were into certain intellectuals, yeah? Clerics. 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 They're seminarians. See, this is to preach to seminarians. These are the birds, that's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a sermon preached to seminarians, see? And he's telling the seminarians that if they don't look out, they're all going to hell, see? So therefore, uh, you have to realize that uh, this is a different situation from today, because if you want to say that, I've, I mean, no matter what may be the advantages and disadvantages of seminary life, today they're more or less, uh, it's, it's a relatively tame affair. I mean, it may be, uh, may have its uh, drawbacks and so forth, but you wouldn't, if you were preaching a sermon to seminarians, the first thing you wouldn't say, well, for heaven's sakes, look out, you're all going to hell, see. But this is what St. Bernard says to these students in Paris, these are these clerics in Paris. And of course, this is a very, a very important part of his doctrine. And really, if when you see this, you see that if you don't understand the background of St. Bernard, you don't get at all what he's talking about in anything. I mean, even, for example, his doctrine on love, you don't understand it fully unless you see it against the background of secular love that was going along in the 12th century. Because it was a great, I mean, love was a big thing. Love always has been a big thing, but in the 12th century... <laughs> <laughs> but in the 12th century, there was a whole new, new angle on this business of love. And this had a big effect on St. Bernard's doctrine on love. It also had a great effect on several other things that he wrote about. What was the chief thing that happened in the uh, early Middle Ages in regard to love and literature and social, the, the whole outlook on, on love and life and stuff like that? Who's, who's had this sort of stuff in college? Brother Dunstan, do you remember well, there's one great thing that happens in the Middle Ages, a very important change in the outlook of people, uh, a really fundamental change. Brother Cyprian, do you remember you? Uh, Paul the Cross. Chivalry. chivalry, all right, chivalry, and that had a, had a big effect on, on the attitude towards what or who? Women. women, towards women. See, this is extremely important, is it, the, the, the fact that in the 12th century, 
a whole new attitude towards women came up. What was the what was the old attitude and what's the new attitude? Brother Paul across. Well, I suppose just, uh, the new attitude was to honor women. Yeah, idealization. They started all of a sudden women started to be idealized and honored. Whereas before they'd just been treated as sort of domestic animals. See. And you know, that really that's that was the idea. The woman was nothing. See, the woman was just as on, on the same plane as the horse, the cow, the dog, and the woman, you see. Something he owned, part of the property. Whereas in the twelfth century, the woman comes to be now idealized. And of course, one of the effects of that in theology was what? What yeah. Would be is uh, things in the Blessed yeah, the Blessed Mother, you see. that This is the time when, when all of a sudden veneration of the Blessed Mother comes in, too. Hard to say which came first. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, veneration of the Blessed Mother goes along with this attitude towards women, a new attitude towards women. Now, there are other new attitudes coming in. The 12th century is a very important time of change, and it's just, in many ways just like our time. See, The time when new things were starting to pop. And it's just like the Vatican Council. When you've got new things popping, what have you got? You've got conservatives and you've got progressives. See, And there were an awful lot of progressives in the 12th century. And the progressives in the 12th century were very progressive, and a lot of them were way out. See, Which side was St. Bernard on in the 12th century? Brother Paul of the Cross. He was on the conservative side. You know, the Cistercians were a strong block of conservatives. But this, it isn't the same kind of conservatives as today. It's a different kind of conservatism altogether. See, uh, they are uh, for holding on to the theology of the fathers and the contemplative life as taught by the fathers and the contemplative tradition and staying out of the world and so forth. And this other, well, what was the progressive trend? What was the new trend? What does it constitute in the twelfth century? What what made things progressive? What if you were in the twelfth century and a progressive? What would you be studying, Brother Cuthbert? Well. Precisely what philosophy? Aristotle. You'll just be, uh, you're just not right, not yet Aristotle, but it's, he's coming along. You haven't quite got to Aristotle yet. What languages are you studying? Latin. Greek. <laughs> they all knew Latin. I mean, the, the, the clerics all knew Latin, but the progressives are studying Greek. The old timers don't know Greek. Bernard, not a word of Greek. Didn't know any Greek. Not interested in Greek. William of St. Thierry might have had some contact with Greek, but not much. So uh, in, in the 12th century, if you're a progressive, first of all, you're studying Greek. Okay? And you're not only studying Greek, but you're beginning to translate Greek. And you're beginning to find out about Aristotle. But where's Aristotle coming from? You're not reading Aristotle in Greek. You're getting Aristotle from someplace else, Brother Kieran. He's, he's, oh. he come from the, uh, the, from Islam, from the yeah, he's, he's coming in, in Arabic, translated into Latin. See, so then, if you're one of the progressives, you're also reading Aristotle, beginning to get ready to read Aristotle, translated into Latin. See, now Peter the Venerable, who was a very um, bright fellow, he's right in the middle. Of course, another thing is coming in too. Another important branch of study that's growing is what, besides Greek and and uh, see, it's going to be Aristotle's logic, especially that they're going to study Greek and dialectics, and then there's another very important one that we don't usually think about at all. Who knows? Science. science, medicine especially. See, medicine and the beginning of natural science. They're the first, just the first little bit of a, of a, they're not really starting what you'd call science, but they're starting a new attitude towards the universe, a new attitude toward the world. See, that the world is, is something important worth studying, and you don't just get what Scripture tells you about the world. You start looking at the world itself. This is new. I mean, in, in the Dark Ages, before that, then nobody, you know, if you want to talk about a tree, for example, to make some statement about the trees in the garden, well, what do you do? You open up the Bible and find out what the Bible says about trees. You don't go out and look at a tree. You look into the Bible because the Bible tells you everything. When I'm in the 12th century, you get people taking this different view, see. And where did this happen mostly? Does anybody know? What school? The School of Chartres. The School of Chartres. This is a, uh, the School of Chartres is terrific. I'd like to do some work on it, but it's not quite relevant to us. But uh, the School of Chartres comes in contact with the Cistercians at one point where William of St. Thierry... The William of St. Thierry is the guy who's always denouncing these people. See? William of St. Thierry is in his monastery watching what's going on outside. And then, for example, the, a novice enters this monastery where William of St. Thierry is, and he's brought Abelard's book along. 
And uh, he looks at this, oh, good heavens, what are they reading? And he writes a letter to St. Bernard and denounces Abelard, and that starts the whole thing. See, this whole fight between St. Bernard and Abelard, because a novice came into a Cistercian monastery with Abelard's new theology. So, now then he also started denouncing the school of Chartres. He, he ran into something that they taught. He said, oh, this is horrible. They're saying that the world is, uh, I don't know, something. He didn't like this scientific approach, so he denounced them. But he didn't get very far with them. They were rather sharp people. Uh, so then, you've got this big contact with Muslim Spain. And this is very interesting. And you've got people going down to Muslim Spain. And, and Peter the Venerable, for example, had a team working in Toledo, Spain. And, you know, Toledo is a very important place because it's right on the, uh, it's sort of practically sort of the, the point of contact between Muslim Spain and Christian Spain at that time. What else is Toledo famous for? Have you read the right kind of novel? Well, what it's famous for? Yeah. Steel. Steel. Toledo, and what did they make the steel, what did they do with the steel in the 12th century? Yes, swords. Swords, yeah, Toledo blades. <laughs> you had your Toledo blade, you went. <laughs> if, uh, you, you fellows should be reading Sir Walter Scott, but I guess you, or you never did, probably. But there's a lot about Toledo blades and that, you know. You, uh, and uh, so this was a great center, and um, the Arabs had these uh, swords and horses and things like that. And they were down there translating manuscripts. They even translated the Quran. St. Peter, uh, Peter the Venerable had them translate the Quran into Latin so that they could study it. And his idea was that when you were going to, you know, if you wanted to deal with the Muslims, the thing to do was to read the Quran and find out what they were trying to say and then go discuss it with them. St. Bernard's idea was different. <laughs> so you take the Toledo blade and run it right through. <laughs> and then uh, discuss it afterwards. Uh, well, it's, it's easy to see the difference between the progressive approach and the, uh, the conservative approach. And then, of course, another very important thing was mathematics. See, they all became extremely mathematical at this point through contact with the Arabs. Yeah, that's, uh, that's right. Algebra. See, the word algebra is a, that's, that's one of the words in the English language that comes, that's part of the English language and comes right out of Arabic. And there are a whole lot of, there, what are some of the other words? This is a very, very interesting thing to study where words come from at a certain time, and then you get this contact. What, Brother Basil? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, you've got Arabic numerals, all right. And what's, what, what was the, the most important Arabic numeral? A really revolutionary Arabic numeral that you don't have in Latin, in the, in the Roman, and that you get in, in the Arabic, and it revolutionized mathematics. Zero. Zero. See. In the 12th century, the whole thing was, was completely turned upside down by just this zero coming in. <laughs> it's amazing what, you, what, 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 a, what a change it makes. See, in Roman numerals, you've got no zero. And anyway, who'd like to work out a multiplication? <laughs> One of these real nice, long multiplications in Roman numerals. I don't, I don't know how they did that. But anyway, so that, that was another thing. And then there was also, what are some other uh, Arabic words? Alcohol. Alcohol, definitely. <laughs> See, these, this very revolutionary stuff, because <laughs> they had alcohol before, but they just didn't. Uh, what's another th uh, Arabic word? Very important for us in a, in a material way. It plays an important part in my life about 4 o'clock in the morning. I don't know about yours. Some of the students, usually. Coffee. Coffee. Uh, <laughs> that's from that's from Arabic. Uh, they, they discovered coffee. How did they discover coffee? Don't you know the story of how coffee was discovered? Was, uh, some some Arab, some Bedouin was out in the thing, and he's out in the woods, desert somewhere, and his goats were eating these beans, and they got, you know, they were they were weaving around. He said, "Hey, that stuff must be pretty good." <laughs> so, so he went and ate some himself and said, well, it would probably be better if we ground it up and put it with water. See? And so that's how they discovered coffee. He was eating these little berries on the bushes, or coffee bushes. And then this is an interesting one. This is curious. I came across this, started working on this uh, material here. The word Czech actually has an Arabic origin, Czech. But it's a, a very curious story of how it gets into the English language. Uh, of course, it indicates that at this time there's a, there's a great deal of commercial and cultural interchange between the West and uh, the Islamic East. But now, how does Czech get in there? It's quite curious because Czech is related to chess and checkers. See, and chess, the name the name of the game chess, comes from the fact that in Arabic 
the king in chess is the Shah. See, the Shah of Persia. You know, you talk about the Shah, he's the king, see. And so this idea of, first, your first step then is that you get chess coming to the West with the idea of chess means the Shah or the king, see, in chess. And then you've got the idea of checkers, a checkerboard, which is tied up with this. Now, how the word check gets in is in England is the Department of the Exchequer. You've had this. <laughs> well, tell the rest of it. <laughs> No, it's the way they they had counters that they moved uh, uh, actually they had a tablecloth it was a check tablecloth and the the English exchequer that is to say the Department of Finance met in this room with this check tablecloth and they would move these counters around on the tablecloth to show how much money they had see and from then and then it moves on and moves on until you get the word check finally coming as a, uh, I mean, I don't know where the step comes in. There is a jump in there somewhere to this idea of a check, uh, of which you tear off and you give have, uh, give one part to another person. You've got a little check stub to, to find out what you what you did with the stuff, if you ever signed checks. I wasn't very good at signing checks. I didn't have any money. But if you remember what it was like signing checks, you sign one thing and then you put a little note on the other on the stub in your checkbook, see. And uh, so anyway, that's that's one indication of this cultural interchange between the Arabs and the Christians. Well, now, this idea of going to Toledo, some people, here's, a, here's an Englishman, and of course, another important thing in this time is that people are moving around a great deal. See, no stability. There, I, mean, I don't mean the monks, but the seculars, these students. If you were, here we are again, we're progressive students in the 12th century. Supposing you're starting out in England, well, where would you go to school? Where would be the normal place to go to school? You wouldn't go to Oxford or Cambridge yet, because they're not really started, 12th century. So what, what would be the, perhaps the first thing that would occur to the mind of an Englishman who'd go to school in the 12th century? One of the first. That was Paris or even Ireland. Ireland might come to his mind first. See, a lot of them went. Can you think of a saint of our order who, who went to school in Ireland from England? Anybody? Yeah. Stephen Harding. Stephen Harding took off and went to Ireland to study. That would have been one choice. But then you had all sorts of other choices. You'd go to Paris, or you'd go to Chartres. Or if you want to study medicine, you'd go down to Sicily. You'd go to Palermo. See, now This was a very interesting place. This was uh, all mixed up with Muslims and Christians. They were all, all buddies there. Barcelona? Not much. No, no, not Barcelona. You go to Bologna for law, or Padua for law. And then, uh, and then if you wanted to go on this, in this Arabic, Arabic thing, you'd go to Toledo. So here's an English student. Here's a quote from an English student. 12th century. <clears throat> he's writing to his bishop, and he's in Spain. <laughs> Dear bishop, I'm down here in Spain. What am I doing? Well, here's what I'm doing. The passion for study had driven me out of England. I was for some time at Paris, but in Paris I found nothing but savages. Installed with grave authority in their scholastic thrones, with two or three stools in front of them covered with huge books, Representing the, the reproducing the lessons of Alpian in golden letters. Now, who's Alpian? Does anybody remember who Alpian is? Anybody ever know? I think he's a lawyer. I think it's some sort of a, a late Latin Roman law stuff. And with uh, lead pens in their hands, and they are gravely writing on their books asterisks and other signs. Their ignorance, ignorance made them constrain them to remain like statues. And they pretended to show their wisdom by their silence. But as soon as they opened their mouth, I heard nothing but babblings of children. Having understood the situation, I reflected how to get out of the risks of this and to embrace the arts which uh, uh, throw light on the scripture in some other way than just by saluting them in passing. <laughs> and so, since today Toledo is the place where the Arabs teach, and this consists particularly in the arts of the quadrivium. These are the sciences, see. So you've got, to, you've got to go to Toledo to learn science from the Arabs. And this is given out to the crowds. I hasten to get there in order to listen to the lessons of the most wise philosophers in the world. Friends, having, reminded, having called me back and having uh, invited me to come back from Spain, I am now back in England with a precious quantity of books. And they say that, that in these regions, here in England, the teaching of the liberal arts is unknown, and that Aristotle and Plato and so forth had been forgotten. Uh, and so he goes on and says, well, what a wonderful was it, what a wonderful thing it was to be in Spain learning these sciences from the Arabs. So that's one thing. But now, of course, 
What's going to happen if you get people going studying science from Arabs? See, a Christian's going to Spain and studying science from Arabs. Naturally, they're going to come back to the Christian lands with what kind of an outlook? What will be their what will be the new approach? Will they be uh, extremely docile and submissive? Will they accept everything that somebody tells them, or will they be what? Cut it. No, they'll, 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 they'll be critical. They'll question everything. See, so therefore, all right, with this moving around and this uh, spirit of traveling, you also get a critical spirit arises. Now, in that book that we had in the refectory, the man about Saint Thomas, the man was he divided it up into these two spirits that were fighting: the spirit of reverence and the spirit. What was the other one? Criticism or something or rebellion? I think he said. See, what? I always remember he always said reason. You know, oh, is that what he said? Yeah. Uh, well, it was the difference between authority and reason. See, and these people wanted to figure things out. Well, <clears throat> we're not getting anywhere. I got some awful good stuff to read to you here, but I'll probably... Uh, here's another text from John of Salisbury. Now, he, he liked Paris, and so does this other man like Paris. He says, I have just made a turn through Paris. What did I see? Lots of food, happy people, the, the <laughs> clerics surrounded by respect, the majesty and the glory of the entire church, the diverse activities of the philosophers, I seem to see with, f with full of admiration the, the, the ladder of Jacob, of which the summit touched the heavens and with the angels going up and down. Delighted with this happy pilgrimage, I, must, I had to avow, the Lord is here and I did not know it. And the word of the poet came to my mind, happy the exile of he who has this as his dwelling. See, now he thinks Paris is very good. This is a wonderful place. He's delighted with Paris. Now, what? remember, uh, he's talking about Jacob's ladder here. Another one compares it to Jerusalem. See, Now you've got to Paris. You've found the heavenly Jerusalem. It's the, it's the dwelling of David and so forth. Well, they call Paris everything. Uh, St. Bernard called it not the Jacob's ladder, not the heavenly Jerusalem, but the gate of hell. See? And, but what St. Bernard calls Jerusalem is the monastery. So his idea is that the monastery is the, is the right kind of school to go to, and that these, the monastery is set up against Paris as the true school, the school of Christ. And uh, Paris is the, is the school of not only liberal arts and sciences, but also of an evil life. See, Peter of Sells, he says this, O Paris, you know well how to ravish and deceive souls. The nets of vice, traps of evil, the arrows of hell destroy the innocent in your streets. Happy, on the other hand, is that school where Christ teaches to our hearts the words of eternal wisdom. This is the monastery. See? And where, without labor or courses, we learn the way of eternal life. We buy no books, we pay no professor, we have no embroiled disputes, no sophisms. The solution of every problem is simple. We learn the reasons for all things. See? But how do we do how, This is a different kind of learning altogether. This is the contemplative wisdom, see? in which we learn not by investigating things, but by going to their source, and so forth. So that's that contrast. Well, I want to read you a little bit of stuff that isn't at all edifying, but it's very important for the history of the period. And this is the kind of uh, a reflection of student life, the sort of poetry written by the so-called Goliards. See, now you need to... Uh, it's, good, it's good to have heard of these people. These are these wild students, clerics, uh, gyrovaging all over Europe. They're wandering students, the wandering scholars. And their lives are devoted to uh, trying to get some kind of a degree so that they'll get some kind of a living. But meanwhile, their, their chief occupations are gambling, drinking, and <laughs> chasing after the girls. <laughs> See? And they've got all this poetry that they wrote, which is very interesting. And some of it is very funny. And a lot of them are drinking songs. And this is the kind of thing that St. Bernard is preaching to, see. I mean, when St. When when Bernard is preaching in Paris, you've got to think of these Goliards, because these were the fellows in the audience, see. And, the, and some of them entered Cistercian Monastery. Some of them would get converted, like Sir Law Wilton or Helenand was one at one time, I think. Oh, he was perhaps a court poet. But uh, the, these people uh, would sometimes get in the monastery and then reform and live a good life and so forth. Now, the ancestor of the Goliards was an Irishman, this goes back to these early Irishmen in the time of Charlemagne. There's a wonderful man. He isn't a bad person at all. He's, an, he's an, a real good Irish monk who got chased out of Ireland in the Norman invasion. And he went to Liège in the ninth century. See, that's in Belgium. 
And this is a man called Sedulius Scotus. Anybody called Scotus, it means he's Irish, except that Duns Scotus really is a, a Scot. The Scots and the Irish are closely related. And Sedulius Scotus uh, was a poor Irish scholar living in Liège under the patronage of the bishop. And when he ran low in funds, he would write a poem. He was a poet. He would write a poem to the bishop and say, Hey, bishop, I'm getting low in funds. And then he'd sort of turn this poem in a real nice sort of way. And then the bishop would come through and uh, give him some more money to live on for a while. And he and a bunch of Irishmen were living in this old house in Liège and trying to survive on the food that the bishop would give out to them. And then they'd teach courses and so forth. And they're always broke. This is typical student life. That's a beautiful Latin poem. I'd love, I'd love to read the Latin. I'll just maybe, maybe, maybe two lines of Latin, because it's so beautiful. And then some, somebody tell me what the Latin says. Nunc viridant segetes, nunc florent germine campi, nunc turgent vites, et nunc est nunc pulcherimus anus, nunc picte volucres per mulcent etera cantu, nunc mare, nunc tellus, nunc celi sidera rident. This is your, this is your old classical Latin rhythm. See, these are hexameters. What's it about in general? Anybody get any, any, yeah? Uh, it's the pastoral Yeah, it's, it's, flowers growing yeah. It's that's right. It's the spring. See, it is spring. See, it is spring. See, <laughs> so he starts out with this, uh, but now I'll read it in English. You see the whole thing. <clears throat> see what it's all about. Now greed are the cornfields, and bloom is on every bough. The vineyards are now in bud. The best of the year is now. The air is soft with the songs of motley birds the while. Now sea, now land are smiling, now stars in heaven smile. But ours is a bitter potion, the saddening truth is this, we're out of mead and beer, and, Gaff and Bacchus's gifts we miss. Alas, <laughs> what manifold shrieking the flesh pots are subject to, and the earth so prodigal of fruits, and the air of dew. I am a writer, I own it, an Orpheus, a second musicus, I. I am the ox that treads out corn, may someone profit thereby. Yes, I am your knight of learning, armed with a poet's pen. Muse, ask our good father bishop, when do we drink again? <laughs> 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 so the, <laughs> so this, is, this is very nice. He said, Ulius Scotus is like this. He's a civilized man of the 8th century. But you get down to the 12th century, it, is, it gets pretty rough. <laughs> but there's, there's one man, he's called the arch poet of Cologne, I think he is. Or I don't know, these are the Carmen Burana. And this is a drinking song. <laughs> and it's about life in the tavern. <laughs> and it's a wild... <laughs> it's a, it's a, uh, I don't know how much time I've got. Perhaps I'd better just read a little bit of it in Latin so that you'll get the, the feeling of it. <laughs> he's, he's saying we drink one to the, to the Pope and one for the faithful departed and another one for all Christians and one for vagabond monks. <laughs> I get up to about... And he said, after this, he says, everybody's drinking, he says. Bibit hera, bibit heros, bibit bilis, bibit cleros, bibit ille, bibit illa, bibit servus cum ancilla, bibit velox, bibit piger, bibit albus, bibit niger, bibit constans, bibit vagus, bibit rubus, rudis, bibit magus. <laughs> bibit pauperet e grotus, bibit exulet ignotus, bibit puer, bibit canus, bibit presulet de canus, bibit soror, bibit frater, bibit anus, bibit mater, bibit ista, bibit ille, bibunt centum, bibunt mille. <laughs> What was that, more or less? <laughs> Brother, yeah. For the whole world. <laughs> no, well, they're, they're all drinking. See. Uh, the old man, the young man, the exile, the unknown, the boy, the uh, the 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 uh, the dean, <laughs> the president, the old woman, the mother, the the slow man, the fast man, the uh, the captain, the, the parish priest, and so forth. They drink, the poor man ill at ease, the no account gone overseas. They drink, the boy, the reverend man, the prelate and dean both clink the can. They drink, the <laughs> <laughs> they drink, the sister with the brother. They drink, they drink, old maid and mother. What hundreds, nay, what thousands think? Drink, 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 drink. <laughs> so, so this is this is the kind of people that Saint Bernard was dealing with. See. They were interested entirely in drinking and gambling and that sort of stuff, and he wanted to tell them, now look out, you're losing your soul, see. So when we get to this uh, thing on deconversione, you want to see this as the background. Incidentally, somebody made a record of these, uh, of these uh, Goliard poems, and Matt Scott had it around. I'll see if he's got it, because if he's, if he's got it, it's worth listening to. It's just uh, simply uh, people singing these things, and it's really it's got a terrific rhythm to it. But in other words, what you've got in the 12th century, you've got this terrific outburst of all kinds of life, 
you see. And St. Bernard is coming in there with spiritual life and saying, it's all right, have a good time and all that, but it isn't going to get you anywhere. If you want the real meaning of life, you've got to come to us. And that brings us to the same sort of situation we got today where you've got a lot of monks who say, well, the thing to do is let's have lots of life in the sense of let's broaden out and have a good time. Is it a good time? Adi Torian Mostrum in Nomen